Well, good morning. How are you? All right, excellent. Uh, did I get a wave over there? I did. Yeah, right, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to this series that we're going through, Jesus Encounters. Um, I'm a, I'm a little excited about today because this is a unique one. Um, today's encounter is going to be a little different um, because I think a lot of times we read it and at first glance we just kind of see it as as just a, a similar to many other passages and so we just roll with it and we don't go into detail or look kind of look under the surface and so uh, and I think there's some surprising things in there. Uh, it's not necessarily about the person you're going to find that this, is, this encounter is about all of us. Uh, so let's start off by reading it, and then we'll begin to kind of dig in. So if you turn your Bibles to John 5, uh, we're going to read through 1 through 15. It says, after, there, uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which is... Uh, five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. And when the water stirred up and and, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now, that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, uh, the man that said to me, is, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that no nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. All right. This is an odd passage. Um, I'm just going to start off. Let me, let me pull out some of the things that are odd about it. Uh, one's not so odd, but uh, this pool, Bethesda, even though it seems like a legend a little bit, is a real place. Um, I've got some pictures. So I'll show you if you got them up there. Okay, so that, that is down there. You'll see the, the water down there. You kind of see the colonnades over here. Um, and then there's a little bit more up close picture of the actual pool right here. Uh, this is where people look at. You can go there today and see this pool for yourself. And I have a question. How many of you have seen this pool for yourself? Okay. All right. We got some hands. So some of you have actually gone and been there. I'm jealous. Uh, and I'm excited for you to one day see it as well. All right. So, uh, so this pool is very real. But there's a legend that accompanies this pool that is, I'm not sure if it's, if it's legend or if it like actually ever happened. We don't have any documented uh, cases of there. And, and, and the legend of this pool is actually, and one of these little odd things about this passage, uh, it's told in the uh, mysterious verse 4. So if you have your Bibles and you can look in there, you'll read chapter, verse, chapter 5, verse 3, and then immediately after verse 3, it jumps to verse Five. <gasps> All right. Yeah, it's one of those. This is one of those secret verses that only true people who believe in Jesus can see. Um, actually, uh, there's a there was a verse four. Uh, since it, it, if you go to the King James, it'll be there. Since then, it's been said that that was kind of added later, and so it was pulled out of our modern translations, okay? So, but it's in there. I'll read it for you in King James. It says, this is the legend. Uh, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, uh, after troubling the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So it explains a little bit about this legend. We don't really need that verse because the guy 
the, the invalid later will explain this very same thing. Uh, so it's not like there's any contradiction or any, uh, but someone had put in there to actually give us the legend. The question is, is did that legend actually, actually ever work? That was there people who were healed by this pool? Uh, we don't know. But it doesn't really matter. Because the truth is, is that clearly, a lot of people thought it did. And so this pool uh, would be surrounded by people who were sick, lame, blind, paralyzed, a number hoping that they might be the one who gets into the water first. And in the midst of this scene, with all these people who are just waiting for the water to stir so they can be the first to get in, there's this guy who has been there 38 years. Now, I know you can just read that line and say, 38 years, okay, like, you know, trivia question, how long was the invalid waiting? 38 years, I got it, you know. But can you imagine, you can't, you just, there's some people who have in this room who have not been alive 38 years, so you can't imagine what 38 years is, okay? So it, 38 years, very long time. It's like waiting for a city permit from Huntington Beach Permit Office, <laughs> okay? It, it, it is that long, okay? Uh, you can edit that part out um, when it goes public so we don't get delayed even longer. Um, so, but the, it's, I can hardly imagine waiting like one year, six months, you know, of just waiting for something and for your opportunity, uh, 38 years is a very long time. And I think the reason why uh, the passage kind of pulls out 38 years, because it was true, this guy had been waiting 38 years. But also, it's to kind of send the signal that you might as well have been waiting 100 years, 1,000 years. This, this, is, this is a guy who, this is not working for him. Okay? You know what I mean? It's, it's like at a certain point you say, hey, give it up doesn't seem like this is your thing. And so the shocking part of this is that here's this guy who is in this kind of been waiting forever, hopeless kind of situation. And Jesus walks up to him and he says, do you want to be healed? Now, just think about that. Is there, is there a more obvious question that could be like is there, is there any doubt in the answer to this question when, when you first read it now i mean i i might be reading this into it but there's a little bit of like ouch you know like uh that's a little insensitive jesus can you imagine like you know i don't know if someone you know they've got a cup in their hand that's empty and they're just, you can see like they're they're just they're dehydrated and there's a water fountain two feet away, and they're like on the ground, barely conscious, and you go down and saying, do you want some water? <laughs> you know, you can kind of get it. You don't have to. He's sitting there. He clearly wants to be healed. It feels a little insensitive. But I'm going to tell you, the it, it, question becomes very profound later. The invalid then responds, and it's interesting how his response goes. He, it seems like he actually takes this a little bit as an insult or a dig, because he didn't sit there and say, yes. He goes in def defensive mode. John 5, 7, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. I can't get there. He's on the defensive. He's making excuses for why he's been sitting there for 38 years, and he doesn't ever answer Jesus' question of saying, he doesn't say, yes, please, I want to be healed. But despite that, almost disregarding his excuses, Jesus then looks at him and says, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. 
which was on the Sabbath. Now here's my question to you. Did his faith heal him? That's the typical pattern. But in this case, the answer is no. You'll see in a little bit that he doesn't even know who he's talking to or, or who it was that told him to get up and walk and take up his mat. In John 5, 12, 13, it says they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in this place. This passage doesn't even say anything about, you know, the guy getting up and like clicking his heels and, and like, woohoo! You know, there's no mention of his response to Jesus healing him. He seems almost very matter of fact. They said, okay. You know, and then gets up and the next thing we see, there's this kind of like, you know, in, engaging with the Jewish leaders. Um, told you this was an odd passage, right? Uh, total side note, this is, you know, not the point of the passage, but a, kind of one of those neat things you can geek out about. It reveals that Jesus cares for and, and works in people's lives who don't even know he, who he is. You know, there's this story, there's the story of the ten lepers. There are people who he, Jesus heals and does wonderful things for and who never pay him mind after that. Never, never give him any thanks. Never say, you know, I'll, you are now my Lord, you are now my Savior, you know. Um, and so that's, I, I was like, that's a, kind of a neat point. He doesn't just care for the people who will become his followers. He cares for everybody. But okay, so skipping that. This passage jumps right into the fact that this happened on the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, what you weren't allowed to do was pick up your bed or heal people. That was considered work. John 5, 9 to 10 says that once the man was healed, he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Now, here's one of the interesting things. At this point, the Jewish leaders are just being themselves. They're not, they don't know. They're not being like anti-Jesus work because they don't even know who has healed this guy yet. They are literally, this is just, they're being nitpicky on, on their rules and their laws. And they totally disregard that here's this guy who had been an invalid for 38 years who's now walking. And instead of going, wow, what happened? They're like, hey, you can't do that today. This, who does that? You know, I try to think of a good, the best example I could think of, it would be the police officer who, like, let's say a young couple, their first baby, they're racing to the hospital, you know, speeding to get there because the, the baby's about to be born, and the police officer says, no, I, I you know, I, I see your situation, but you still were speeding, and I got to give you the ticket. You know what I mean? It would be like that. You know, that's not what happens. Even police officers know. Now you give them the escort. But imagine what kind of police officer would be the guy saying, no, I'm going to give you the ticket because you're breaking the rules. I don't care for what reason. Who makes a law like this? The, it, there, there is a law that and on the Sabbath day, you could walk no farther than a quarter of a mile. No, uh, sorry, three quarters of a mile. Um. And so, according to that, if you were starving and food was a mile away on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to go get it. That's how they operated. And so in this case, they're telling this man who had been healed, wonderful thing happened in his life. He's been waiting for this for 38 years. They're going to give him a ticket for breaking the Sabbath. That is what we're dealing with. And so I sit there and I ask you, who does this? Who makes rules that kind of that steal the joy and the hope and the how we love and how we care? We do. We 
make rules all the time that dictate what you can and cannot do, regardless of your intention or your motives or your desire. I think we actually have a really weird fascination and preoccupation with rules. We love our rules. Just think about how often, you know, you're at the grocery store and the person with a full basket of groceries get into the express line that says no more than 15 and you're like, oh, you know, I mean, you, you're just like, how dare they? Uh, it, it upsets you, right? You, know, you don't like it when somebody, or, or when someone, you know, there's the slow lane and the fast lane and the two people are driving the exact speed limit just same exact speed, basically creating a, a roadblock for anybody else who would like to try to get past them. You know, uh, don't they know that the left lane is for passing? You know, uh, you, you, there, how many things do we sit there and we say, ah, no, ah, they're breaking the rules. The rules are there, and we don't question why. We're not asking, oh, they must be in a hurry, or... They're obey, you know, whatever it is, we just don't like that they're breaking our rules. And the world has so many of these. Now, I'm not going to try to be insensitive or provocative in this thing, but I'm just going to say we have so many rules for how we speak and how we talk. There are words you cannot say. There's a rule saying you cannot say this word or it, you know, you, you will ruin your life. Um, there are their order of words. You can say certain words, but you better say them in the right order because if you say them in the wrong order, then you're an awful evil person. And I, I think you see this most clearly. And I hate to say it, I'm actually in this world now because I'll be talking to my own kids. It's, try to talk about a controversial subject with someone from a different generation. It is just hilarious to watch. You know, uh, like I said, I, I feel it now with my kids. And they're like, Dad, you can't say that. I'm like, what? What did I say? You know, and they'll explain to me that I said something the wrong way. Um, and, but I remember when we were like, you know, we used to joke about that when we would talk to like, Heather and I would talk to our grandparents, you know, or, uh, and they would be talking about how things used to be. And we're like, ooh, can't say that. Oh, you know, uh, you know what I'm talking about. There, try having a conversation about anything controversial with a person from a generation, a different generation, or a different culture. Maybe someone who's new to English, and they're like, "Wait, I'm not allowed to say such, such things." You know, um, what you'll find is that you stop caring about what they're saying, and you're, and you care more about how they're saying it. And it's not about what they mean, it's about, you know, how, like how they performed. It's an interesting world, and that is just the reality. We police language and rules, oh, uh, and we've even said, people even say today, your, the, your intention of what you were trying to say doesn't matter. What matters is how you said it. It's like, to me, that feels like it's completely the opposite. It should be, what did you mean to say? And I'm going to judge the, the quality of that. Did it, were, you, were you meaning to be disrespectful and ugly? Or were you not? That seems to me more important than how you said it. But before you think that's just a world problem, I'm going to say, guys, church loves its rules. You can probably sit there and think about right now, all the rules that, you know, that churches have implemented. You know, no dancing. You know, no, no, no secular music. Um, you know, no matter, I, I hate to admit this, some of my favorite Christian songs are secular songs that I kind of like have warped their meaning. You know what I mean? Uh, and uh, so either way, that's just me. Uh, I've taken it and they mean something different to me. You know, just imagine, and we did this as a test today. I want to know if you caught it. We spiked the communion grape juice. Okay, so how many of you are feeling it right now? Okay, no, we didn't. 
We didn't actually do that. But what if we did? What if it was actual wine? And we had passed it around, and you took a swig of it, and you were like, oh, you know. Would you be like, oh my goodness, it's wine, you know. Uh, you know, the reason we do grape juice is because that's a rule now. You don't actually serve real wine at, at you know, not to mention that the kind of wine that you would get for communion would be disgusting. So we don't do that. Um, certain rooms used to be off limits, you know. Youth, you can use anything in the whole building, but not the sanctuary, because that is holy, and apparently youth are unholy. And so you're not allowed to be in here to play. Uh, you know, I, this is one I do. and I, I struggle to get rid of an old Bible, no matter how beaten and worn it is. I, I sit there and I go, I cannot put you in the trash. You know, uh, it, it's, it's one of those things that I just feel like, is there... But I was thinking about, you know, if, if you were like farming and you buried Scripture under your farm, that would be beautiful, you know what I mean? It'd be like, oh, I want God to be the one, you know, it'd be this neat thing, but yet, but, but I can't throw something, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, we put rules on, why, why? I don't know why, I just do it. And apparently, one that I fear, saw early on when we came here, is apparently on this stage, you must wear shoes. And so today I'm just going to do the, I'm going to go, go without the shoes just to make a point that I don't think it affects my preaching. I don't know. Maybe it does, but, but we have that rule. You know what I mean? It's like, what's going on? Why do we have those rules? We don't know. We just do. And here's one of the crazy things about rules. When a rule is a rule, we somehow don't question it. Go to the pool, this pool of Bethesda, where the man was. There are so many questions I have about this pool, but nobody's asking them. Why does only the first person that gets in the water get healed? Why? You know, why couldn't it be everybody who gets in the water when it's, when it's stirred heals? You know, what, why, like, who would make healing a competition? You know, like we're in the Olympics right now, and can you imagine the 100-meter dash as the water stirred, and only the fastest person gets to be the one who gets healed? That would be, it would seem cruel and unfair. Why do you make healing this competition of the most desperate people? Why only is the water stirred occasionally, seasonally? You know, why wouldn't God sit there and just stir it all the time? And have it just be kind of like always bubbling. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because it's a rule, not a person. If the pool was, a, like let's say the, it wasn't a pool, it was a hospital where people are kind of in charge and you were to sit there and say, okay, we're only going to heal the first person who comes through the doors today. Everyone else, too bad. You have to wait. People will be like, what? Why? And what if you were to sit there and say, you know what? Um, we're in ER, but we're only open from 9 to 2, Mondays through Thursday. Okay? And then if you get sick any other time, sorry. You know, too bad. Uh, you hear what I'm saying? If it was a person we would sit there and go, I don't understand why you have these rules. But because it's just a system, it's just a set of rules, no one questions it. People just go along with it because that's just the way it is. Same thing goes for the Sabbath. And that's the connection here. Because then the Jewish leaders kind of come up to Jesus and they say, you know, not to Jesus, to the man who had been healed, hey, don't you realize it's the Sabbath? What the man does not do is say, why does that matter? Can't you see that I'm, I'm walking for the first time in 38 years? You know, uh, he doesn't even question it. No one questions it. Why can't you heal on the Sabbath? It makes zero sense why you can't. But apparently that was a rule and no one questioned it until Jesus. 
And Jesus would be the one to sit there and go, I don't think the Sabbath thing means what you think it means. And, and actually, this is one of the reasons why this passage and why it's in here. It's because it's helping us to see why Jesus rubbed the religious leaders so wrong. Why they wanted to kill him like we heard about last week. Why they didn't like him. He was challenging their rules and their systems. Jesus questioned the rules. I want you to notice something about this story. When Jesus approaches the man, he doesn't sit there and say, I'm going to help you get into the water first. He doesn't sit there and say, watch me stir up the water. I'm just going to stir it up all day long and people can just keep getting in there. He doesn't do any of that. He says he, he sits there and he simply says, and now we go back to why the question makes sense. He sits there and says, do you want to be healed? Because it seems like you're trying to, to like follow the rules. You're trying to be the guy who who does it right. I'm just going to ask you, do, do you want to be healed? Because if you do, we don't have to do it by the rules. I can just do it. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He would basically say the same thing about the Sabbath in John, 15, John 5, 16 to 17. And he says, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing th these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. Basically he's saying, I'm going to do God's will. I don't care what rules you have in place. I'm going to do God's will. And if God tells me to do something, if my father says to do something, I'm going to do it. Regardless of whether it's okay by you or not. Um... When Jesus finally reveals himself to the man who is healed, he actually is kind of revealing himself to all of us. Because I said, like I said earlier, we, we are all caught in this world of are we going to do the right thing or are we going to follow the rules? You know, it said, John 5 14, it said, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. So it, to be kind of parse this a little bit, what you end up seeing is that he's at the temple. So he was healed, and now what he's doing, if you guys don't know, when, if you were healed or made clean, you would go to the temple and give thanks. And whatever little offering you would give, you would give it. Uh, but that's what you did. That was a rule follower thing to do. Uh, now that was actually a good one. You know, that was one that was given to us in Deuteronomy where God said, that's what you do when you get healed. And so he finds the man in the temple following the rules, doing what he's supposed to, and he then he goes up to him and he says, hey, I did that. You're healed. Now go sin no more. And here's the interesting thing. And he says, or else something worse may happen to you. And so this, just a little thing. This guy has not come to faith in Christ yet. He's still following the rules. We don't know quite how he responds to this because, uh, let me just put it this way. If you're if you are all already a follower of Christ, there is no or else, you know, kind of thing in your life. Um, this is him now putting the choice before this man. You can keep following your rules or you can see that I saved you. I healed you. Crazy thing is we don't really know the man's answer. And actually there is a little bit of a suggestion that... Um, that he may not have placed his faith in Christ because right after this, he goes and tells on Jesus to the religious authorities. And he says, oh, that's the guy. That's the guy who healed me. Now, we can give him the benefit of doubt. Maybe he was excited. Um, but either way, point being is you've got this, this scenario where this guy has said, you know, can I still sit there and follow the rules and I know the rules are those guys are in charge. You have to get to the water first. If you get healed, you know, all these little things. Or you can sit there and say, do you want to be healed? Because if you just want to be healed, Jesus will do that for you. The man still is caught up in this game because he still doesn't quite know what to do. 
in the end, we don't know what happens to the man, but that decision, um, you know, God knows what decision or choice he made. I think this passage is here to ask you that question. Are you someone who follows Christ? Or are you someone who follows the rules? Uh, and that is a very different thing. Yes, we can make rules that help us follow Christ, you know, kind of like, but very easy for us to do is then be say we're going to place our faith in the rules rather than, than the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you've ever been in a situation where you said, I know the right thing to do is, but it's, it's, you know, I can't do it because, or there's some other thing that, that you know, I, I don't know. I mean, let's say you have a situation where, you know, your neighbor needs your help, but it's Sunday morning. You go to church on Sunday morning, so I can't help you. Sorry, Sunday morning, can't help you. You just follow the rules rather than following, I mean, I, I'm going to assume that the Lord wanted you to help your neighbor. But you know what I'm saying. We do that all the time where we have certain things where we say, I know the right thing to do, but I don't think I can. The hard reality is that if you want to follow the rules, you're going to end up like this invalid, this man. And you're going to be waiting for a very long time to receive the things that only Christ can give. This man waited 38 years trying to do it by the rules, and he just remained sick. The rules do not give hope. They do not make you feel love. They don't bring joy. Christ does. And it's sometimes those very rules that we put in place that keep us from following Christ with a full heart. And I think that's what this passage is trying to put before us today. Let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you so much for the challenge you put before us with this um, account. Um, Lord, we ask that we would not become like this man, uh, that we would not be people who can't break out of the rules mold. Lord, we want to be guided by your Spirit. We want to be guided by you. Um, and Lord, I know we, sometimes the rules make it easy for us to know how to do that. But then may we never lose sight that it is you and you alone who give us the joy, the satisfaction that we yearn for. Lord, I pray that we would truly become followers of Christ. Um, not some system, uh, nothing else. But help us to love you and seek you with a whole heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.